there. Genesis chapter 28. We have read this a few times. We're going to read it again. Uh, we looked at the promise of Israel, the promise of the place, the promise of the people. And tonight I want to look at the promise of the presence. Uh, we looked at the, the spiritual and physical restoration of Israel and how they are physically uh, being rebuilt. Spiritually, they're going to be rebuilt. We talked about the land. Uh, today, I want to look at the presence that God promised. Uh, he promised with, when you think of Israel, there is a place involved, there's a people involved, and there's a presence involved. I want you to know something that any time that you're dealing with the nation of Israel, you're dealing with God. Any time you look at the nation of Israel throughout history, we're going to look at history tonight. We're going to have a history lesson to see the hand of God upon the nation of Israel. And any time throughout history you look in, at the events and all that's going on with the nation of Israel, whether they deserve God, whether they deserve His power, whether they deserve His help, you always see the hand of God upon them. In Genesis 28, uh, we can start in 13. He's telling Jacob, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon thy lives to thee will I give it unto thy seed. There's the promise of the place. Verse 14 is the promise of the people. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now verse 15 is where we're at tonight. And we find the promise of the presence. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So here the Lord is telling Jacob that I'm going to bless you with this piece of property. I'm going to bless your seed. And I'll tell you something else I'm going to do is I'm going to be with you. And there's going to be times that you leave this land and I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to bring you back into this land. Egypt was one of the times that they left the land and they were brought back. Babylonian captivity was a time. And other times were times that God said that you will leave this land, but I'm not going to leave you. You may leave my will, but I'm not going to leave you. And I'm so thankful today that God kept us promise with the nation of Israel. And God never left them. There's many times that Israel left God. But never one time did God leave Israel. Yes, there was times that they allowed, He allowed them to face bondage. There was times that He allowed them to be conquered. But every time they had an opportunity to be saved from that. Every time God offered them deliverance. Every time God offered them grace. Every time that they got in trouble, it was their fault and not God's fault. God made a promise, I'm going to be with you. Whether you're in this land or another land, I'm going to be with you. If you get uh, driven out to another land, I'm going to bring you back again. I'm going to be with you. And now in the New Testament, as a New Testament believer, I'm glad that promise is still applied to our life as believers. That when we get saved, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm glad God doesn't leave us. Amen. I'm glad He doesn't give up on us. His presence is ever about us as His people. Now, I want you to look in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43. And I, I read this promise a lot, especially to people that I counsel with that's down and low and in need to be lifted up a little bit. Uh, but in context, God is talking to the nation of Israel. In this promise, in these seven verses, is a promise that God made with Israel. And this is his desire for Israel. Notice what he said in verse 1. <coughs> Isaiah 43 verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I've called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Isn't that beautiful for God to say you art mine? <laughs> you are mine. I've called you by name, I've brought you out, I've redeemed you, and you are mine. 
When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame be kindled upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. God is saying, I'm giving all of this for you because I love you. Look, Notice verse 4, since thou was precious in my sight, Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. Why? Because God loves them. And he said, I've given Egypt for your ransom. He said, since thou was precious in my sight. Isn't that amazing to be precious in the sight of God? In Israel, God is telling Israel, you're precious in my sight. I'm following you. I'm there for you. I will give men for you and people for thy life. And think about In in all the ages, how many people God has given for Israel, but most important, His own Son He gave for them. His own Son He laid down just because Israel was precious in the sight of the Lord. Notice what He said in verse 5, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Boy, what a loving God. This is how precious Israel was in the sight of the Lord. Israel rebelled against God. Israel was disobedient to God, but they were precious in His sight. So He gave men for them. He gave countries for them. He gave Egypt for a ransom. We are precious in the sight of the Lord. The Jews are precious in the sight of the Lord. I want you to know that when God looks down on us, He loves us. Isn't that amazing? How dirty we are to the Lord. How dirty and how, how awful we can be to God and all He's ever been is loving and, and forgiving and faithful to us. Isn't God good? Can somebody amen tonight? Man, you're precious in the eyes of the Lord. I don't get it, but that's the grace of God. And that's what He told Israel. And He promised them His presence. He said, I'm going to be with you. Man, this thing's flopping everywhere tonight. Get it fixed here in a minute. But God said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And I'm going to bring you back again. Now, I want to go through a history lesson. And I just want you to bear with me. And I want to look at the timeline of the nation of Israel. And I want us to see the hand of God. Israel has had a time the last 3,000 years, 4,000 years. They have had a rough time. They've been around a little over 4,000 years now. They've had a rough time. But I want you to understand something. I believe you're going to see this. No matter how unfaithful, how rebellious they were, God has always been with them. God has always seen them through. And as a New Testament believer, it does me good to be reminded how faithful God is. No matter how many trials we go through, God is still there. No matter how lonely we feel, God is still there. Even when we've been awful and we've been unfaithful, God is still there. I want you to look at the hand of God upon the nation of Israel. In 2000 B.C., the covenant was made with Abraham. The the country of Israel was formed through the promise that he made with Abraham. In 1460 B.C., the exodus from Egypt, we know that Uh, the nation of Israel was brought out of Egypt, out of Egyptian bondage, and the law of Moses was given. In 1040 B.C., King David had conquered Jerusalem. And then the, the seed of David and the throne of David began to be established upon the nation of Israel. King David is, in my opinion, the greatest king to ever rule and reign upon the face of the earth. But there's one coming better than him, and his name is Jesus. In 997 to 990 B.C. was the building of the first temple. This is David had acquired all of the the things that was needed for the temple, but his son Solomon ended up building the temple. At 960 B.C. was the end of King Solomon's reign. 
uh, the, the Lord had brought peace and prosperity to the nation of Israel. They were thriving. When Solomon was king of Israel, people came from all over the earth. I believe the kingdom of Israel had never been greater uh, under the, the reign of King David and King Solomon. And, and all the people of the earth would flood into there and they would see the glory of God in this country and in this nation. At the uh, 960 B.C. was the end of King Solomon's reign. And that is when the kingdom was divided. It was divided into Israel, the northern kingdom, and to uh, Judah, the, the southern kingdom. In 722 B.C., the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah. I want you to understand that when... Israel was conquered by Assyria and the lower part was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. This was the beginning of the losing the power of their nation. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed uh, the temple. They destroyed the temple that Solomon built. They destroyed the holy place. They destroyed all of these things. But most of all, Israel lost their nation that day. And that was in 586 B.C. Israel re did not regain until 1948. That is how long the nation of Israel went without being a country. And when you look at what they went through and all of those thousands of years of being scattered about, may I remind you they were scattered because of their disobedience to God. God told them to, through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, there's a man coming called Nebuchadnezzar. If you will just put away all of your sin, I'll save you right now. They took a pen knife, they cut up the Word of God, and they burned it. They had no desire. God wanted to save Israel. They lost everything there in 586 B.C. There at 539 B.C., Cyrus uh, the Persian conquered Babylon. And then Zerubbabel in 520 B.C., Zerubbabel built the, the second temple uh, in Jerusalem. And then when the Persian king took over, if you remember, he allowed the Israelites to begin to go back to the land of Israel. And then the Persians kept the country of Israel until 333 uh, B.C. And then Alexander the Great came in and took over. Now, the, a lot of the Jews were living there, but they had no authority. They had no power, okay? It was really no longer their country. They were there residing under the Persians. And then in... Uh, 333 B.C., they were there under Alexander the Great, okay? And so they're under this rule and this reign. They have no power. They have no government anymore. They are beginning to be scattered upon the face of the earth. And then in 168 B.C., uh, the revolt of the, of the Maccabees that came in and, and uh, took over the city of Jerusalem and conquered Alexander the Great. And they began to rule and reign. Again, the Jews were living there. They were residing there. They, were, they had homes there, but it wasn't theirs anymore. They had lost everything. It was no longer theirs. In 63 B.C., the Romans came in and occupied Israel. Rome became a dominant power in the world world to establish uh, peace through ruthless oppression of all dissent. Rome come in and with a stern hand began to rule Israel. And there the Jews are living in this land and they have no power, they have no rights because the Romans are ruling them. But remember all of these years ago, God gave them a promise that I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you. He told them, you're precious in my sight and I'm going to give people, I'm going to give kings, I'm going to give nations and countries for you. Here they are, rebellious, have turned against God. They've been living now for 500 years in their country that doesn't even belong to them anymore because they rebelled against God. Now, in 63 B.C., the Romans come in and everything begins to change. In 30 A.D., the death and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, during that time, during his ministry, the New Testament church was started. All the oppression upon the Jews during that time. In 66 A.D., the first 
Jewish revolt against the Roman rule. In 70 AD, the Romans under Titus captured Jerusalem. They destroyed the second temple. They went through and oppressed all of the Jews. They killed every Jew that they could. The Jews began to be scattered upon the face of the earth. Don't forget, God gave them a promise that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. In 132 AD, the second Jewish revolt uh, under Bar Kochba, the Romans put down the, the revolt with great ferocity. Hundreds of Jewish communities in Israel was destroyed. The Jews were scattered from the promised land once again. In 135 A.D., the Romans conquered Israel. It said the Temple Mount was plowed with salt, and the Jews were banished from Jerusalem on pain of death. Jerusalem renamed Aliyah Capitolina. The land was renamed Syria, Palestina, or what we know today as Palestine. This was done in a deliberate attempt to humiliate Israel by favoring their ancient enemies, the Philistines. The Arabic word for Philistine is Palestine, which comes the English word Palestine. And so basically in 135 A.D., the Romans banned the Jews. And any Jew that was around, they threatened to kill them. They, they did anything and everything that they could to wipe out the seed of God. To wipe out the seed of the Jews. May I remind you, God told them a thousand years ago that you're precious in my sight. I'm not going to let anybody destroy you. God made them a promise that He would be with them. Friend, God makes good on every promise that He ever made. We go all the way to 638 A.D. The Romans had conquered the land of Israel. They had ruled all the way up until 638 A.D. This is shortly after the religion Islam is instituted by Muhammad in 622. 632, the death of Muhammad. But in 638, Caliph Omar conquered Jerusalem. And this was a Muslim leader. This was the start of the return of of the Jews. And in 130 A.D. until 638 A.D., the Jews were not allowed in the land at all. And any Jew that was seen or found was killed and murdered. But I want you to understand this. 638, when Caliph Omar conquered Jerusalem, he was a Muslim. And under Muslim rule, Jews were permitted to return into the city. Boy, things have changed since then, hadn't they? In 1095, the first crusade, Jews were massacred across Europe. And the crusaders' armies marched towards the Holy Land. In 1099, Jerusalem was captured by the crusaders. And the Jewish and Muslim inhabitants were slaughtered. There was blood shed across the city of Jerusalem. In 1190 A.D., the massacre of Jews in York, England, hundreds of thousands of Jews lost their lives simply because they were a Jew. Simply because they were the seed of God. In 1290 A.D., Jews were expelled from England. Why? Because they were Jews. And everybody upon the face of the earth hates Jews. But God made them a promise. God made them a promise that I'm going to be with you. They're hated by everybody on the face of the earth, including America today. We're getting there. But let me tell you something. God still loves the Jews. In 1290, Jews were expelled from England. In 1306, the first expulsion of Jews from France. 1394, the second expulsion of Jews from France. It was illegal in countries to be a Jew. To be an Israelite. In 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain. They were scattered upon the face of the earth, and everywhere they went, they were hated, they were murdered, they were killed. But remember, God made them a promise. God made them a promise. In 1881, the Russia, the pogroms in Russia, Jewish communities in Russia were attacked. It prompted migration of Jews from Eastern Europe to the Holy Land. This was the second and great regathering of Israel started as a trickle. And so there in Russia, Jewish communities were slaughtered just because they were Jewish. And so that began the Jews to come back into the land that God had promised them all of these years ago. 
In 1888 started the first Eliah. The word Eliah is a Hebrew word that means the migration of the Jews to the land of Israel. They have been scattered upon the face of the earth. Please stay with me. In this first Eliah, continued persecutions prompted the first wave of Jews to migrate from Eastern Europe to what was then called Palestine. In 1904 was the second. A second wave of Jews, mainly from Russia and Poland, migrated to Palestine. They were driven by persecution. It is amazing they left Israel because of persecution. Now they're being driven back because of persecution. In 1914, Turkey had allied with Germany. Turkey had had the land. The Ottoman Turks had had the land for 400 years. Turkey, the occupiers of Palestine, allied with Germany at the start of World War I. There in 1914, World War I began. In 1917, General Allenby of the British defeated the Turkish rulers of Jerusalem. And there that day, the British expressed their support in writing for a homeland for the Jews in Israel. That very day, the Jews made a statement to encourage all the Jews to come back to the land of Israel. Isn't it amazing that God prophesied two and three thousand years ago that this would take place? 1924, the fourth Eliah, a fourth wave of Jews, mainly from Poland, migrated to Palestine. In 1939, Britain sets limits on Jewish immigration. A limit was placed on Jewish immigration to Palestine and on the purchase of land by the Jews. In 1939, World War II and the Holocaust began. Six million Jews lost their life in the Nazi concentration camps simply because they were Jews, simply because they were of the seed of God. After the war, thousands of survivors of the death camps made their way back to the promised land. Nearly every one that survived those concentration camps was sent back to the land of Israel. 1948, open fighting between Jews and Arabs in Palestine. Britain refused to cooperate with a partition plan, washed its hands of the Palestine problem, and announced its withdrawal. On May the 14th, 1948, the state of Israel was declared. The new state was immediately recognized by the USA and Russia, but not by Britain. The next day on May 15th, the last British troops departed and Israel was invaded by five Arab armies, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. The first Arab-Israeli war began. During this war, there was another 120,000 immigrants, Jewish immigrants, that was brought back. Between 1948 and 1952, hundreds of thousands of Jews migrated back to Israel from Europe and Arab countries. I don't know about y'all, but God is good. God is good. I see through all of this that God is good. In 1967, after they declared in 1948, after being scattered upon the face of the earth, they declared again in 1948 to be a country. How did they become a country again? Because of the mighty hand of God upon them. 1967, the Six-Day War began. Israel captured the old city of Jerusalem in six days. Israel gained control of Jerusalem. The Sinai desert, the Golan Heights, the Gaza Strip, the, and areas of Judea and Samir, which became known as the West Bank. Listen, in six days, Israel more than tripled the size of the area it controlled. You say, how in the world did they do that? By the mighty hand of God. 1970, the start of migration of Jews from the USSR to Israel. 1989, communism collapsed in the USSR and Eastern Europe. Mass immigration of Russian Jews. One million moved to Israel over the next ten years. 1984, there was 7,800 black Jews rescued from Ethiopia. 1991 was the Gulf War. In that year, a 36-hour airlift, codenamed Operation Solomon, rescued over 14,000 black Jews from Ethiopia. The Gulf War was a U.S.-led coalition liberated Kuwait from Iraqi occupation. 
Israeli was bombed by, Israel was bombed by Iraq Scud missiles, even though she stayed out of the war. Jewish immigrants continued to arrive in Israel throughout that period. I believe we were involved in the Gulf War. I remember the Gulf War. And during that time, Israelis and Jewish people began to come home. 1993, the Israeli and Palestinian negotiations began. And they're still negotiating today. Israeli and Palestinian negotiators conducted secret talks leading to the Oslo Agreement. President Clinton presided as the Prime Minister of Israel signed the Declaration of Principles with Yasser Arafat of the PLO. Still today, Israel and the Palestinians are still trying, Palestine, Palestinians are still trying to sign a peace treaty. And I'm going to tell you this peace treaty is going to be signed because the Bible says it's going to be signed. And the, the prophecy that God made and gave the nation of Israel has come true. It has been fulfilled. And now the only thing that is waiting is for the peace treaty to be signed. The peace treaty is the start of the tribulation time. May I tell you how close we are to seeing Jesus split the eastern sky. May I tell you, as I look at this, I see a country that was no good. I see a country that was unfaithful. I see a country that was rebellious to God. But I see a God with a loving hand and a loving kindness and a loving grace upon a country that was unworthy. But He made them a promise all of those years ago that He wouldn't leave them or forsake them. He said, you're precious in my sight. In the book of Zechariah chapter 12, The book of Zechariah chapter 12. This is a prophecy that I believe is fulfilled today. It says in verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people around about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Friend, all the people of the earth is wanting to destroy the nation of Israel. God said, I will make them a burdensome stone for all people. And all people will rise against the nation of Israel. But at this time, the nation of Israel will cut all people into stone. I believe that Israel cannot be touched today. I believe that 6.4 million Jews is living in the midst of 300 million Muslims who desire to kill the Jews, who has a hunger and a thirst to destroy every Jew living. They cannot touch them. Why? Because the mighty hand of God is upon them. Such a small country. But I want you to know that Israel is a mighty country. The zeal of the Lord is upon them. The strength of God is upon them. There is a confidence. There is a boldness. There is a zeal in the minds of the Jews today. When uh, an individual graduates high school, whether it's a male or female, you go right into the army. And then as you go into the army, you go to boot camp. And then after boot camp, they swear them in at the place called Masada, there where they gave up in in A.D. uh, 70. And that's where they committed suicide. And they take all of the Israeli soldiers there to swear them in. And the swear that they make is, and they're reminded on that place, that as a Jew and as an Israeli soldier, we will never, ever give up the land of Israel ever again. I've been there. I've walked among them. They love their nation. They love their country. They have a passion and a desire that this country ought to have for our own country. Everywhere you go, the Israeli flag is flying with no apologies. They don't apologize for being who they are. Praise God. They know that God's hand is upon them. And some of the greatest military advancements, some of the greatest inventions that has ever been in the world came out of the nation of Israel. Penicillin came from Israel, the cell phone was invented in Israel. Some of the smartest people in the world are Jews. I want you to know that God, that Jews are on the cutting line of everything in the world today. Why? Because God made them a promise. And I want to close with this tonight. If you've ever heard of the Iron Dome system, 
It is the most sophisticated military system in the world. It defends their land against military strikes. Any rocket that is fired into the nation of Israel, there is ten iron domes in the land of Israel today. Their goal is to get five more. And with these iron domes, it is the most sophisticated piece of technology that can track any rockets, anything that is fired in their country. And immediately is shot out out of the sky. Every day rockets are fired in the nation of Israel. Every day people are attacking. But they cannot touch them because they have the most sophisticated technology in the world. Even other countries say that the hand of God is upon them. Even other countries say the Iron Dome system is a work of the Lord. I want you to know that nobody can figure out how to kill them or destroy them. Because friend, the hand of God is upon upon them. And I'm just going to shout right here. In 2014, there was a story that was published. A man said, personally witnessed the hand of God. It's, it was said, Israel Today translated a report from the Hebrew language news site which noted the Iron Dome battery failed three times to intercept an incoming rocket headed toward Tel Aviv last week. May I tell you, this system never misses. This system is always on. The commander of the Jewish army that seen this rocket coming in, this was his story. A missile was fired from Gaza. Iron Dome precisely calculated its trajectory. We know where these missiles are going to land down to a radius of 200 meters. This particular missile was going to hit either the Israeli towers, which is our equivalent of the Pentagon, or their equivalent of the Pentagon, or a central Tel Aviv railway station, which could have killed hundreds or maybe even thousands. We fired the first interceptor, it missed. The second, it missed. This is very rare. I was in shock. This never happens. At this point, we had just four seconds until the missile lands. We had already notified emergency services to converge on the target location and had warned of a mass casualty incident. Suddenly, Iron Dome, which calculates wind speeds, among other things, showed a major wind coming from the east, a strong wind that sent the missile into the sea. We were all stunned. I stood up and shouted, There is a God. I witnessed this miracle with my own eyes. It was not told or reported to me. I saw the hand of God send that missile into the sea. God's good, isn't He? God is faithful. God's hand is upon this country. And the Muslims can't touch them. Iran can't touch them. Lebanon can't touch them. Syria can't touch them because the hand of God is upon them. And that Jew stood up and said, I have seen the hand of God. Friend, the hand of God is upon the nation and the people of Israel. And may I tell you that God's hand is still over His people today. The devil has come into this place. He is destroying our homes. Homes. He is destroying our lives. But may I tell you, God made you a promise. He said, no matter where you go, no matter how disobedient you are, I'm going to be with you. No matter what the devil throws at you, no matter what's going on in your life, my hand's going to be upon you. The Bible said that nothing can pluck me out of the hand of an almighty God. The devil can't pluck me out. I can't pluck me out. You can tell me all day to go to hell and I can't go there because I'm in the mighty hand of God. And I want you to know that I'm safe in that hand, just as Israel is safe in the hands of the Lord. He gave them a promise all those years ago, I'm not going to leave you. Story after story after story. The Jews, that commander, started shouting. This Iron Dome system's never missed. It never missed. Suddenly, there's a wind. You know, atheists would say, what a coincidence. God's people, woo, praise God. Amen. We know it's no coincidence. We know who the master of the wind is. Amen. And we know the hand of God is upon them. And bless God, it's upon us tonight. Man, I tell you, God's good. God is faithful. 
His hand is upon us. He's protecting us. I don't care how much evil is among you and trying to destroy you. You remember greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Remember He said, if you're going through the fire, I'm there with you. If the waters are coming, I'm there with you. I'm going to see you through. I'm going to give nations for you. I'm going to give people for you. I'm going to give men for you. Very simply, because we're precious in the sight of the Lord. I'm a lying, thieving, no good sinner. Boy, y'all like that as a pastor. What a description, huh? I'm no good, but I'm precious in the eyes of the Lord. Man, I'm glad He loves me. I'm glad He's faithful. I'm glad He's there all the time. Let's stand very quiet, very reverent. And maybe you're here this evening, and maybe the Lord is bringing this to you. Because you're going through the trial of your life. And you're battling and you're going through things that you just would never imagine. I, I want to remind you the hand of God is upon you. If you're saved and you're called by His name. Remember His hand is upon you. And He's going to see you through. 2,500 years Israel was without a country. And God saw them through for 2,500 years. If I live to be 80, I think God can take care of me for 80 little old lousy years. Amen. Amen. 2,500 years they were scattered. God's hand was upon them. Man, did He bless them. And here we are in this life thinking we're all alone. We're never alone. The battle's real. The battle's hot. The battle's ever before us. But bless God, we're not alone. We're not alone. He said, I'll be right beside you. Through the fire, through the water, I'll be right beside you. Child of God, maybe you just need to fall down and say, Lord, thank you for being beside me. Lord, this is tough what I'm going through. Just see me through. These altars are open. Maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to make a public decision tonight. As she plays, y'all come.